not supersonic, they're not long rangers, they're not very young, and they don't autopilot. Yet the sea harriers sporting a ghostly grey camouflage are said to be a breed apart. Give her 120 meters on a runway and she'll take off. Test her in a dogfight and she'll stay invisible until it's too late to dodge away. Give her a target in the sea and watch her bomb it. Direct her to a spot and let her hover and recover with a vertical drop down to the flight deck. No other operational fighter jet in the world today can carry out a vertical or short takeoff and landing on an aircraft carrier like the Sea Harrier. Little wonder then, the Harrier squadron on board the Virat called themselves the White Tigers. The Harrier is designated as an FRS, that is a fighter reconnaissance and strike. Uh, so just get into that, a fighter would mean air defense cover, reconnaissance is self-explanatory and strike would be in case of an offensive package being delivered either at sea or on land targets. As the Virat sails into the Konkan waters, it's business as usual for these Harrier pilots. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, the mission for today is RP firing live. They're being tasked to carry out a four aircraft strike on a sea target almost 100 nautical miles away from the Virat. Armament. Each aircraft is configured with combat tanks and rocket pods. Each of you is armed with eight into 68 mm rockets. Fuel total of 6,400 pounds. And like all men in uniform, they have to be prepared for every eventuality, be it dealing with a bird-hit aircraft or negotiating enemy interceptors that suddenly appear on their radar warning receivers. The launch time for the mission is 0840, for which you would be walking at 0820. Meanwhile, a few decks below in a hangar that looks as big as a football field, the aircraft are being readied for the bombing sortie. The armament gets strapped onto the aircraft and soon she's on her way up to the flight deck in a giant elevator. pilots too are ready for their mission, armed with their combat gear and an attitude to match. It is believed that these fighter pilots rank amongst the best in the world, because unlike most contemporary combat fighters, the Harriers depend on a fighter pilot's skills than her own capabilities. And mediocrity here is unacceptable because an average sortie is most probably an unsafe sortie. And so, as these super elites get ready for a new assignment, it's not just about strikes or stripes, it's about sustained excellence. Because military flying is often about flying to the limit and then being prepared for that limit to be broken. Currency is one thing this aircraft recognizes. It doesn't recognize your stripes, it doesn't recognize your experience. If you're not in the cockpit, if you're not current, you're going to make mistakes. And this is a, a very laborious process. It has to be done and it is. It has to be done continuously. As the carrier prepares for a new cycle of air operations, her flight deck seems a buzz with activity. This characteristic flat top 
that doubles up as an operations readiness platform and a runway for the fighter jets is a classic study in optimum space and time management. It can host almost 14 Harriers, 8 Sea King helicopters and 6 Chetaks at any given time. We've got 9 spots on the flight deck as you can see starting from 1 there and finishing with 9 plus the angles for the sea areas. So usually we keep the smaller helicopters ahead, the larger helicopters behind and the areas there. And uh, within three minutes we manage to launch everything. But before the Harriers are launched, it's time for the Chetak pilots to hit the deck. These light helicopters operate in a search and rescue role on the aircraft carrier. And so, they are invariably the first ones to get airborne during Harrier sorties, always in anticipation of an emergency in air. So many aircraft, so little space. It's a challenging task for the men handling flight operations on the carrier. Their job is to get maximum aircraft on the deck and then get them airborne within the least possible time. But this also makes the flight deck one of the most dangerous work environments in the world. One careless moment and crew members can get sucked in by the fighter's powerful jet engine or be blasted off the deck's edge into the ocean. So though sometimes flight deck operations may seem like a crowded football field in action with close to 40 men in colorful jerseys, the action is always well choreographed and coordinated. And the man in charge is the flight deck officer. My role is the parking of the aircraft, the taxiing of the aircraft, all ground movement and once the clearance comes from the flight code to launch, the final clearance comes from me, whether the aircraft is clear to launch or not. I look after the safety aspects, the takeoff sequence and everything else in the environment also. Once the deafening roar of the jet engines takes over, it's a mind game between Lieutenant Commander Harit and his team, dressed in color-coded jerseys. They use over a hundred hand signals to communicate with each other and direct the pilots. It's a theater of strict discipline through the heat and the noise, where if anyone makes a mistake, many others are likely to pay with their lives. You have to think on your feet and get things going. And once all the aircraft start up, there is no talking. Everything is on hand signals and you get the team worked up, things go up quite well. But just before the Harriers taxi down the runway, it's time for the mandatory Foreign Object Damage or FOD parade. It's a regular drill that's performed on the flight deck before and after an aircraft takes off or lands. The idea is to scan the entire length and width of the flight deck and rid it of any foreign bodies from metal pins and pens to carelessly thrown crumpled paper balls. Here even a minor slip up could lead to a crash and inflict serious damage to the aircraft, ship and her crew. And contrary to perception, a hard and bouncy landing is better than a soft and smooth one. <laughs> <laughs> 